So I'm here with, with Richard Nicholson, the GPSL's product manager for the GPSL S1000D for Windchill product. How you doing, Richard? Hey, Charles. So can you describe sort of what you your uh, your job is as, as far as product manager for, for S1000D at GPSL? So it's to act in several roles, really. The first role is with the supporting the sales and pre-sales organizations. Um, so any new customer who has initial questions about S1000D, I kind of get involved to sometimes educate them on S1000D, kind of do an overview um, and things like that. So it's a lot of introductory explanation of why S1000D is the way that it is a lot of the time. Um, and then using that information knowledge of what the customers are wanting, we help drive and work with the product development team to then build and expand our S1000D capability. Um, so this is driving the star sheets, the windshield development and our text editor authoring work. So that at that point, it's more focusing on how to author S1000D and then ensuring our compliance when we're delivering the PDF output and the uh, external output so that the ITP viewer support and things like that. So it's a little bit of everything all the way across the, the board. So you help plan out. So, so the product development team here at GPSL practices agile development. So they, they run things in, in sprints and you help them plan out the sprints. So I'm, I'm the responsible for creating the backlog um, of all the stories that we have and then working through the refinement with the actual team to make sure they contain enough information. Um, and sometimes that involves creating sample data. Uh, and sometimes it's just pointing to certain areas of the spec and saying, make sure it works this way and so on for specific formatting examples. Let's talk about the S1000D spec for a minute because it's 3,000 pages of of goodness. Um, I think you've read all 3,000 pages, but uh, how did you wind up getting into S1000D and, and spending as much time as you have with the S1000D spec? It was actually a mistake, I realized. So 23 years ago or so, um, I took a job out to university working for CSC, um, Computer Science Corporation. Um, and this was working with BA Systems in the UK. I was actually hired to do SAP development. So during the interview and so on, we were chatting about SAP and the coding behind it and the involvement with it. I took the job along with, there was 13 of us that all got hired at the same time. And on the day that we started work, the tech pubs manager walked into the HR department and said, one of his staff's just left. He's got an urgent project, needs a programmer who's available. And the HR person said, well, he's just started. I said, I'll take him. I ended up working on IBM mainframe publishing systems rather than SAP development. And then from there, it was the publishing through to S1000D when they migrated over to that. Wow, what a fork in the road <laughs> of a career. It, life. Yes, life could have been very different afterwards. Yeah, I'd forgotten about that actually, thinking about that through the day. So in the S1000D fork of your uh, career, where did you wind up um, spending as much time as you did with the with the spec? I mean, were you part of the committees or, or what? Actually, let's start back with what version of the spec uh, did you start working with? 1.8, I think, was the first version I used properly. Um, getting full exposure with. Um, and that was, as I said, so I was working with BA Systems and they were authoring the Tornado and Harrier manuals in AVP 70, the British uh, military specification. And they wanted to migrate over to S1000D. So we started to create a, a FrameMaker S1000D application. And then from there, it kind of snowballed through all the different specs. Yeah, I think 1.8 was the, the first kind of exposure to it in FrameMaker. Wow. So SGML. Yes. And so I've been not directly involved in the committees, but I did work with the working group for the graphics for a while. So interestingly, uh, graphics is a, a topic that's near and dear to, to lots of our customers' hearts. Um, where do you see graphics in S1000D going? So I think that the graphics are going to head in two directions, as it were. So one is keeping the current printed output direction. So a lot of people still rely on PDFs and paper publications and output like that. 
but I think going forward, SVG and mm -hmm. 3D more device neutral um, and browser capable graphic formats are going to be the key for everything because as more products become computer driven, interactive, things like that, they just need to move to a more dynamic format. So this could be SVG interactions, dynamic graphics, kind of what we're labeling multimedia in a way. Mm -hmm. So what else do you do for fun outside of the S1000D spec? My cat, I do have a very silly cat who likes to be hit by cars, or photography. I started that two and a half years ago now. So that's really quite a passion of mine. Yeah, no kidding. I would have never guessed that, that you were only two and a half years into uh, taking photos, Richard. I've seen some of your photos from air shows and uh, from your walkabouts, and they're fantastic. Thank you. So you have you have you've been to a couple of the different air shows in the UK, right? Uh, yeah. So I started that last summer. Um, the first one I went to was the Southport Air Show because it's near where I am, and we got to go down to the beach and we got to see the typhoon flying, which I did enjoy watching just that go through because BA Systems built it at Wharton and it was designed there, and so and that's where I first started. So I feel, mm -hmm. although I never directly worked on the Eurofighter program itself, I always supported the team and the other staff working there at BA Systems. So I feel like I have a little part of that involvement. A little stake in it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what kind of industries have you worked in? I mean, so uh, over your career, sort of, you know, S1000D touches a lot of different industries. What ones have you become familiar with? So industry-wise, it's been mainly manufacturing companies. So definitely the air industry of military aircraft and things like that. Um, but also just civil companies, so working with different manufacturers of aircraft and from the small like two-seater models um, all the way up to working with working with the sporting companies building the jumbo jets and so on. Um, I think one of the most interesting ones that I found was a wind turbine company 10, 15 years ago maybe now. But yeah, they were using S1000D to document their turbines that they were deploying into the North Sea. Even back then, it was definitely some people adopting it as a civil, non-military style documentation system. What do you find for customers is one of the hardest parts of adopting S1000D if you're starting from scratch? I think just being overwhelmed by the whole of concept of S1000D. They see the specification. They just, unless someone can sit down and take them through the high level items of it, a lot of people do become intimidated, if not scared, by what they have to do. But once you break down things like the deciding some of the business rules, don't worry about the whole 500, 600 that are there. Just understand the concept behind it. Start with that. Start with one or two data modules. Understand that. The authoring of XML. You break it down. It's not a, an insurmountable problem for people, but it is, for some people, just a very different concept in how you're working. So Richard, I mean, you know, in the next iterations of of the GPSL product and the industry as a whole, you know, where do you kind of see S1000D trending? I see it uh, ableizing a little bit is maybe the the next focus for the short term is just allowing people to migrate from other standards and other versions of S1000D up to a current standard. I think a lot of support needs to go in to helping projects in that environment, but long term for S1000D I think they have to adapt beyond just paper-based tech pubs, embrace the ITP environment, embrace the interactive connected environment, um, mobile devices, things like that. Because um, I think the world just has to change to a more computer-based, interactive-based world. And as software equipment becomes more technical, it's going to be a lot more embedding in electronics, information being fed back, that then leads into more information being fed back from the system itself, support and maintenance information, um, just everything becoming connected. And the information overload is a definite possibility with the equipment that we work with. Do you see a, do you see a role for VR, AR in that scenario? I think it's there's a role, but I, I'm I have to, I may be slightly skeptical on environment. I think it's a very good for training. Um, so for someone who's learning to be a mechanic, um, 
augmented reality and virtual reality is a very good training tool for them. But in some of our customers, uh, obviously military environments, I don't see augmented reality as really being useful in the field. So in the middle of a, a desert environment or a combat situation where there's battle damage on equipment, I don't really see the extra effort that goes into managing augmented reality and so on being useful. It's going to be more of a hindrance maybe at that point. But yep, so that's yeah, more of a training role. I think so. I think it's very suitable because you can repeat an action over and over again, see it several times before you then try and do it. So if you're halfway through a maintenance and you want to reset, you can't really do that on a physical equipment. But if you're watching the steps in augmented reality unfold, you can kind of fast forward, replay, rewind, understand it better. And then when you then do it, it will take you through each step before you do it and then as you do it it'll keep up and so on that's a really good point well cool i uh i appreciate the time and and the uh chance to talk with you and uh look forward to seeing the gpsl uh products that come out under your uh your watch thank you charles it's been fun to chat <laughs>